Small bowel neuroendocrine neoplasms, I suppose one divides them up into the duodenal uh, neoplasms and you, there you might get little polyps which are incidentally found at an endoscopy or gastroscopy procedure looking into the stomach for other reasons. And a little polyp is found in the duodenum which is the first part of the small intestine. And usually these polyps are completely indolent and often if they're less than a centimetre in size, uh, one may just keep that under observation for many years. If the polyps are greater than a centimetre in size, then there's a possibility of them spreading to local uh, lymph nodes. And it may be in that scenario that one would look to remove uh, the polyps endoscopically. The caution there is you need to go to a gastroenterologist or an endoscopist who is very used to doing removal of uh, these polyps because there are different new techniques uh, available and actually you, sometimes you have to be very skilled to remove um, polyps which are growing a little bit deeper into the uh, duodenum um, because there's a risk of perforation making a hole which one doesn't want uh, to happen. It's always a possibility but one would advise you always want to go to a skilled endoscopist who's got experience in removing polyps in the duodenum. Very rarely do you get uh, more aggressive uh, polyps um, at which might uh, require uh, surgery. Some of the uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms in the duodenum can be associated with hormonal secretion. So gastrinomas, so polyps which make the hormone gastrin, um, are found in the second part of the uh, duodenum. And so that's easy often to diagnose because patients will often have problems with recurrent ulcers and diarrhea and you can measure the hormone gastrin in the blood um, as well. And other rare types of um, neuroendocrine neoplasms, somatostatinomas, uh, can be found in that area as well, just where uh, the pancreas and the bile drain into uh, the small intestine that can be a classical place for finding these rare somatostatinomas, neuroendocrine neoplasms, uh, which can be diagnosed on biopsy um, and also um, by measuring hormonal uh, levels. And patients often uh, will require surgery for removal if it's a sizable tumour, if it's greater than one uh, centimetre. If it's less than uh, a centimetre or so, or that sort of size, then it might be possible to remove those and tumours or neoplasms uh, endoscopically. As one goes further down the uh, um, in small intestine, then we come to the more traditional, classical uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms, historically called the midgut carcinoid uh, tumours. And um, for those neoplasms, they're the ones that are more associated with carcinoid syndrome, with flushing and diarrhoea. You would normally need um, to have spread from the primary site in the small intestine, usually to the liver, in order to get carcinoid uh, syndrome. Often patients, again, could be found incidentally to have uh, these neoplasms within the small uh, intestine, again, perhaps at endoscopy or on a, a CT scan. And the other key feature of these midgut carcinoid tumors or midgut uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms found at the end of the small intestine in the jejunum or the ileum is that they can spread to the local lymph nodes and can be associated with very classical features on the CT scans where you get what's called a mesenteric mass whereas a lymph node which is enlarged it can often have some calcification in it because it's been there for some uh, time but it can also be associated with a scarring called desmoplasia. And can also, that scarring can attach to other bits of the small intestine, which can cause twisting of the bowel and therefore uh, abdominal uh, pain. And it's quite often then in that situation, patients would need standard workup for, with uh, CT uh, scans or MRI scans, would often require a gallium octatate uh, PET scan um, if not available, then an octreotide scan. And usually one would be recommending a surgery to remove the primary tumour and the associated lymph nodes. And we sometimes do that even if there's been spread already to, uh, to the liver. And it's not uncommon 
for patients with uh, these midgut, these small intestinal neuroendocrine neoplasms uh, to have spread and to, uh, for us to take quite an aggressive approach of removing the primary tumor so you don't run into problems with twisting of the bowel or blockage uh, of, of the bowel. And it makes it a little bit easier to concentrate on the other areas where the tumor has, uh, has spread. And the standard treatments would be used if a patient's got carcinoid syndrome with somatostatin analogs, either the octreotide LAR or the somatolin uh, autogel, the lanreotide uh, autogel. And if a patient's got advanced disease, then one would be talking about the other standards of therapy. It's rare that one needs to use chemotherapy for the uh, neuroendocrine neoplasm of the intestinal uh, tract, uh, unless it's a high-grade uh, tumor. Often, if a patient has progressed from um, the growth through somatostatin analogs, and the somatostatin analogs, octreotide and lanreotide, have been shown to have anti-tumor benefits in patients with uh, small intestinal neoplasms, uh, as well as anti-hormonal uh, effects reducing carcinoid uh, syndrome. So they're the, hence the first line of treatment. The more recent publications from the NETA studies have shown that lutathera, lutetium-177 octreotate, for patients with growing uh, tumors of the intestinal tract is a very good treatment in, in that group of, uh, of patients and would often be the next go-to uh, treatment uh, option. Uh, so that would sums up the whole of the small intestine. 